Hello and welcome to One on One. My guest today is Dr. Chris David. Dr. Chris David is a futurist, a financial expert, a tax expert, a forensic expert, and more importantly, a developmental economist. He holds a doctorate degree in strategic leadership with specialty in strategic foresight from Regent University, Virginia Beach, United States of America. He has an MBA in financial services from University of East London, UK, and a bachelor's degree in applied accounting from Oxford Brookes University, UK. He is a fellow of Institute of Chartered Accountants in Nigeria and Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria. He is a member of Association of Professional Futurists. Dr. David is the founder CEO Chris David Foresight, a global foresight practice firm. Dr. Chris David was the presidential candidate of the liberation movement in 2019 presidential election in Nigeria. Welcome my guest, Dr. Chris David. Good day. Thank you for having me. Okay, let me start Pleasure. with um, the last part of my introduction, which has to do with you being the presidential candidate of liberation movement. You know, how was your journey into the foray of politics? What was your experience like? And like they will always say, that many people have their fingers burnt. Were your fingers really burnt? Well, I will say I, my fingers were not burnt. Rather, it was um, a good experience uh, because um, I didn't just go into politics because that is or that was the next thing to do, but to achieve a purpose. And um, as a Nigerian, I have observed with uh, great concern uh, how our con great country has been trapped in a morass of a failed state on the account of colossal uh, failure in leadership and bad governance. And um, two key things that you can pin this to, I observed largely that there is this knowledge gap uh, about leadership and what to do. And um, we needed to fill that space with people who are knowledgeable and who have industry experience. Um, in one of the models that I've developed, which I call the pearls of um, effective leadership, I see leadership from four perspectives. The first one is uh, self-mastery. Uh, the second one is about um, system thinking, that mastery of systems. While the third one is having uh, human management. Then the other one is about uh, foresight which is about resource management. And um, clearly, uh, in the past, since the return to civilian rule, uh, that has been deficient. And that's why uh, we have not been trapped in that endless cycle of failure. And today, we have so many of our citizens uh, being impoverished in, in Nigeria. So that was uh, the Delivery. motivation that uh, brought me into politics. Okay. And I did mention that um, I am the voice of liberation. And um, I came into the space to liberate Nigerians and Nigeria from the siege of ignorance. I, I, I'm even coming to that because uh, I understand that you were not just the presidential candidate. You are the founder of the party. And I don't know whether you're also the chairman of the party. So why the name liberation? Yeah, liberation, just like I, I have said, that um, I saw that gap. And Nigeria itself, the way we've been trapped as a nation, uh, with the economy, uh, uh, lack of modern infrastructure, and the fact that human life have become subservient in Nigeria, that people, anybody can just be killed. And no question will be asked, and nothing happens. So I was driven by that uh, uh, liberation uh, movement that people need to be liberated. And I, I am glad that this has 
come to play in the last protest that we saw, how people came out to say that, no, we are tired of this uh, dehumanization of uh, uh, Nigeria. And that is the liberation movement that I saw prior to 2019 election. Okay, um, from record, um, I understand you're in your mid-40s and someone would qualify you as a young candidate. And making reference to the protests you talked about, there's been so much agitation for young leaders, for people to come in. But I want to ask you a pointed question. What is needed? Is it about young leader or a leader with merit irrespective of the you know, age bracket? The issue is not just about uh, the age, but about the qualities, the competencies that the person is bringing to bear. And just like I said, the first thing to give uh, effective leadership is self-mastery. You need to know who you are, what are the skills, what are your values. Then the second thing, you just need to have mastery of processes, mastery of systems. You need to understand how government works. How does the educational system affect agriculture, affect uh, healthcare, affect uh, transportation? You need to be able to connect all that together. And that's why I came up with the concept of smart government. Now, smart government is not an acronym. It's not a campaign slogan. Rather, it is an anticipatory leadership model that engages systems thinking to provide lasting solution by addressing the challenges of society to its roots. So it's not about young, but what are you actually bringing to the table? And that was what brought me out to uh, politics. Because um, I, 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 maybe I should say this, then we'll go on a break so that I will prepare your mind. Because there is this notion that when you have technocrats, because I think you are part of those uh, set of people, when we have technocrats in government, we will have some kind of transformation. But somehow there seems to be some different narratives. We've had the likes of Okonjo Weala when she was here as the Minister of Finance. Um, probably the system couldn't allow her maximize her potentials. We have the uh, Aki Umiadeshino, who is currently the president of the African Development Bank. We couldn't see him manifest that skills he must have gathered in the private sector. But we'll take a short break when we look at how can technocrats make a change where there is a dysfunctional system? That will be hope for a discussion. We'll take a short break. We'll be back in a short while. Welcome back to One on One. In case you just tuned in, I have with me Dr. Chris David, a futurist and a former presidential candidate. Welcome back. So let's look at the last comment I made, and that has to do with how we can have technocrats like you make an inroad, make a difference, or even turn around, you know, governance as it is. Don't you think, first thing first, a, a, a reformed system before you can get in, or you can make a difference even with the current system? Well, the most important thing is getting in, because the system we have today, you cannot change it while you are outside. Hmm. And you know, uh, in, in the 2019 uh, election, most people were saying, why are these young guys running for the presidential uh, position? Uh, why not other uh, lesser position? The truth is that the impact that you need to make it has to be from the top. And that's why when you mention uh, those two other technocrats, they could only impact the little space that they have. And um, you can even know what to do, but if the person you are reporting to, in this case I'm talking about the presidency or the president, do not appreciate what they are doing, then there's little uh, thing uh, that you can bring to the table. So starting from that 
position, you will now make an informed or a very large uh, uh, impact in the, in the system. And that's why you saw that most of the young uh, candidates that came out went for that position because they knew what they need to do and how to transform this country. Because what is actually lacking in Nigeria is that transformational leadership that will actually transform uh, Nigeria to that better society, that enviable society that we don't have. So when you say when you get in, that's when you can make a change. Um, because we're looking at the mathematics that peradventure uh, uh, Chris David becomes the president or Shawara becomes the president is going to be dominated by uh, the, the National Assembly with the, you know, the traditional politicians. So how do you still intend to change the system? Well, guy, we, that's why you saw so many other young guys that ran for those positions, oh, National yes. Assemblies and all that. You understand? Because it's supposed to be um, a general movement, bringing people who know what to do into uh, government. You can be there as um, the president and have some of these people uh, that have been there. What you need to do is to paint that compelling vision and the specific steps we need to take as a people to achieve that preferred future that we yearn for our country. And without providing those steps, uh, most people will not appreciate what you are saying. And that's why my promissory note uh, to Nigerians in, in the wake of that uh, election, I came up with uh, that book, which I call Smart Government, the Preferred Future. And I articulated five unimpeachable steps that Nigerians must genuinely and diligently followed if we need to transform this country from what it is to uh, the first world, any of the first world countries. Because uh, for outsiders, for people who actually been following politics, they're a bit uh, disappointed with the, with the poor showing, pardon my language, of some of you in terms of the number of people that voted for you. So the question is, what is the disconnect? Is it that people are not listening to what you're saying, or are you already discouraged that the people you feel you want to represent will still go for the traditional politicians? Well, that's why I saw the NSAC protest as one of the positive things that have come out of Nigeria uh, since the return to civilian rule. See, you cannot have effective leadership without effective followership. That protest was citizen-led, born of the desire to have a better society. And if this protest came earlier, say in 2018, mm. then the outcome of 2019 will have been a different thing. So going forward, the youth are already talking that we need to engage this space because they've now realized that they cannot disassociate themselves, their private life, from what is going on in, in politics. And that's why we have the discussion about young Nigerians coming into the uh, political space, people recommending uh, new political parties and all that. But like I said, uh, it's not just about registering parties or coming to political place. There are specific things that we need to do. And um, one of it is our value system. We need to address our value system. But you need a leader who understand how the value system impacts on everything in, 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 in a nation. Because the value system is actually the foundation of any nation. All nations are built upon set of values. If you have the wrong values, then you will have disunity, corruption, and all the issues okay. that we are faced with. But if you have the right set of values, then you have peace, progress, 
and prosperity. Okay, Dr. Chris, uh, I'll go on another short break. And when we come back, we'll be focusing on some other topical issues like 2023 presidency. We'll find out whether you still have interest. We'll talk about more on that um, agitations you alluded to, the answers, and most importantly... Welcome back. It's to one on one, and I have with me Dr. Chris David, a futurist, a politician, and call him a, a, a financial expert. But let's look at some day to day issues as we speak. 2023 has already been discussed in many quarters, even when some of them are denying it and thereabout. And one thing that might be a dominant discussion is the issue of zoning arrangement. And it's, it's, uh, we've heard people like you who preach <laughs> meritocracy uh, uh, as against zoning arrangement. But what exactly is the reality you live with? Well, uh, you, I think I need to share more light about the concept of equality, uh, meritocracy, and some of those tenets that uh, will actually give us uh, peace, progress, and prosperity. Uh, the concept of equality simply means that we are all created equally. No race, no tribe, no religion is superior to the other. Then every Nigerian must have equal opportunity to excel. That is the concept of equality. And that is the concept that also drives the rule of law. That's why we said everybody is equal before, before the, the law. law. Now, the concept of meritocracy is not saying that though we are all equal, we are gifted in different measures. So to assess the opportunities that are available, you have to do that based on the gifts or your talent or the skills that you have. So that is where competence not set in. Now, talking about uh, issue of zoning and all that, it, it is, it's not a bad thing to say, uh, for instance, the presidency is going to be zoned to South East in 2023. The question now is that the people that will run from that zone do they marry the position? So that is where meritocracy steps in. So it's not enough to say, uh, based on the principle of equality, let's allow the Southeast to run. We must also make sure that the best from the Southeast is being given the opportunity to run. Now, there is also one principle that um, is rare in this space, which is the principle of excellence we don't exhibit excellence in Nigeria. Now, um, excellence, you know, Dubai, that all of us adore and trying to uh, visit, is built on the principle of excellence, that continuous improvement on our position. And that's why you see, when you get there this month, by the time you are going there next month, the things are changing. Exactly. Yeah, so that's why in Nigeria, I, I somehow um, uh, sad when I see the way uh, our leaders talk about building infrastructure and all that. For instance, look at our Ray project. We are borrowing massively, but we are actually still 20 or 30 years behind the current infrastructure for railway. So we are not pursuing the principle of excellence, excellence. in whatever thing uh, we do. And that's why, you see, things uh, don't actually turn out the way we expect them. The word excellence in this context now looks a bit controversial in the sense that, oh, excellence sometimes is attached to how deep your pocket is. And if we have to borrow, and in your words, we borrowed massively, we borrowed to, to an extent that a lot of people are getting scared, and you still want quality. Don't you think it is the case of excellence being relegated to the background because of our pocket? Well, it could, 
which, what is, what is uh, more relevant? To build an infrastructure that is fit for purpose or for just having an infrastructure. So the principle of excellence that I am espousing here is what you see in Singapore, is what you see in Dubai, is what you see in, in, in Switzerland. In fact, in Switzerland, if you don't have skill sets, you cannot survive in Switzerland because we expect that you improve on whatever skills you have on a daily basis. So if we have to do anything, anything that is worth doing well, then it should be done well. Very well, exactly. But okay, let's, because of time, let's also look at um, this budgeting system, which um, from time to time I hear your opinions, I read, read about your opinions, and uh, I'm asking, the previous government was accused of even borrowing to pay salaries. And we've had situations where it is usually 80, 90 to 10 in terms of ratio for, 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 for um, recurrent against capital. Capital is always at the, uh, at the receiving hand. So how do we build a budgeting system that will really focus on building infrastructure? The truth is that we've not set our priority rights. And that's why we keep having the kind of budgets we churn out year in, year out. Now, it will shock you to see that we have been budgeting deficits in the past uh, five years and increasing every year. However, our expenditure profile, I'm talking about overheads, have not changed. Is it getting increased? Yeah, it's increasing. So that is what we are talking about. Now, if truly you feel that it is important to have uh, infrastructure or to increase, to shore up your capital budget, then you need to retweak your expenditure profile. Now, uh, I use two models in analyzing uh, budget, uh, budget. For instance, one is relevance. Relevant, when you are budgeting, what are you budgeting? Is it relevant to the people? Then the second one is realistic. Whatever figures you are putting forward, are they realistic? Now, these two parameters will help you to churn out an, an efficient and effective uh, budget and it will improve even your performance because these two parameters will make sure that you set your budget priority right in terms of even your income generation and your expenditure. Let's be more specific now. When you talk about relevance and you talk about some of these issues, you remember the war to get the minimum wage upgraded to 30,000 and you also know how you know, many state governors could not even pay these salaries. So these salaries are usually the issue. So if you were the president, like you are aiming to be now, how will you find a way of reducing this overhead cost? The, the truth is, it is not the salary that is the issue. It is what? It is other overheads. In terms of uh, allowances? allowances, the, the, the maintenance, the running cost, those are the issues. In fact, our reward system is actually not right. So uh, for us to get the best from the OCC, and that means our reward system needs to be redesigned. And you cannot be paying somebody 30000 in 2020 and you are beating your chest that you are doing something that is word of praise. So we need to retweak the, our reward system. Some people are taking more than their fair share, while others are well open in, 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 po in poverty. Interesting. Uh, I understand that uh, my time is almost up. This one is one for the road. Is Dr. Chris David's poster going to be in 2023? For now, I have not decided. 
So we can't, we should just call you former presidential candidate? Yeah, if, if this is 2020 and I don't want to um, be, distracted. Be, be distracted. And um, I want to see somebody from the Southeast running for that position. And I will gladly support a competent person from Southeast. This is based on the spirit of equality and uh, meritocracy. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris David, a futurist and CEO of uh, Foresight. Thank you for your insight and we wish you all the best. But Thank it's still safe to call you a politician, right? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. word politician is, is not something bad. Politicians are actually supposed to be statesmen. Exactly. Thank you so, so much. So I am a statement. Thank you so much. And that's how far we can go on today's edition of One on One. I've been speaking with Dr. Chris David. Let's do it again another time when we we'll come up with another interesting guest that will give us more insight on issues affecting the polity. I am Coyote Ladeinde saying bye. <laughs>